Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's webinar to mark International Women's Day. MS Ireland are delighted to be joined by Dr. Maria Gawne this evening to discuss women and MS. So we're going to be discussing topics such as pregnancy, fertility, menstruation and menopause. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, you are welcome to submit them through the chat function and through the Q&A. We'll keep all questions for the end of the session. Um, and we will be asking you to just complete a short survey at the end of the session. If, if, that's, um, if you have the time, it would be great if you could fill it out. So um, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Ron, for um, joining us this evening, taking the time. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to give a quick bio for, for Dr. Gawne and then we will move swiftly into the webinar. So Dr. Marie Gawne studied in University College Dublin, graduating in medicine in 2010. She completed her neurology training in 2019, having trained in Beaumont, St. James's, Cork University Hospital and the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Dr. Gawne was the Newman Fellow in MS in St. Vincent's University Hospital from 2010. 18 to 2020 and is currently completing an Aspire Fellowship. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much Aoife for the invitation to present and particularly to present today uh, on International Women's Day and um, I suppose what I want to do is an issue that uh, an area that perhaps has been a little bit neglected in multiple sclerosis research and you'll probably see that this as the talk goes on that a lot of the studies that we're referring to have very small numbers or there's very few studies done and we don't have definitive answer um, in relation to the impact of MS on women. So some of the questions I suppose that I, I thought of when I was approaching this talk is you know one of the ones is, are women more likely to be diagnosed with MS? Does puberty have an, any impact on MS? Um, does PMS or premenstrual syndrome act, aggravate MS symptoms? Is it safe to use the pill? And a question that we get asked very regularly in clinic is, will it be more difficult to have children because of MS? So are women more likely to be diagnosed with MS? And the answer to that is yes. And women are about three times more likely to be diagnosed with MS than men. Um, and what's quite interesting is that maybe about 40 or 50 years ago, the ratio was about 1.7 to 1. It's now 3 to 1, so that ratio is increasing over time. And we don't fully understand why. Um, it's probably too rapid of an increase for it to be related really to genetic factors. So is it perhaps related to hormonal, environmental factors? For example, women are having less children than they would have in the past and they're often, often having their first child at a later age. Is that having an impact? Uh, we know that smoking is an impact on MS and over the last 50 years, smoking rates in women increased dramatically. Um, or is it that we're actually diagnosing and recognizing MS in women a lot more quickly and more widely than we did in the past? And it's probably a combination of a lot of these different factors than any one thing. So interestingly enough, before puberty and after menopause, the rate of MS between, or the incidence of MS between men and women is actually the same. Um, and that change seems to occur around puberty. And after, in pediatric MS, girls tend to present or tend to have a diagnosis of MS about two years after their first period. So there definitely is a hormonal impact around that time that has a, an effect on the diagnosis and the presentation of multiple sclerosis. What some people wonder is, um, does premenstrual syndrome get worse when you have MS? Does it aggravate MS symptoms? And what you can see really is that there's actually a, a large overlap between the two areas. So fatigue is very common in both. And if you have MS-related fatigue, it's probably going to be worse around the time of your period or just before your period. A lot of people complain of some, uh, without MS, complain of difficulties with concentration, attention and thinking premenstrually. And again, that's so common in MS, it's likely to be an interaction and aggravation. Some of your symptoms related to MS, so if you've got a bit of numbness or uh, tingling what we call paresthesia that you might find that that's worse around the time of your period you might find that you feel a little bit weaker we know that migraine and headache are much more common around the time of your period 
And also, if you have urinary symptoms related to your MS, which for a lot of people is their only symptom at all, we know that um, premenstrually urinary frequency increases. Um, so again, there can be an interaction and aggravation there. There is a lot of debate about the direction though, um, about what's causing what. So around um, the luteal phase in your cycle, for example, you're more likely to have insomnia, which again is gonna increase your fatigue, your feeling of weakness. And also you have a temperature change, your temperature increases. And that can contribute to your insomnia, but also we know that temperature changes in MS aggravate symptoms. Another issue that's come up is does MS itself or the diagnosis of MS make a difference to your cycle? And there hasn't been that much work definitively done on that. And, and most of the work done was they asked people to, who were currently diagnosed with MS to kind of look back and say, do you think your cycle changed? Only one small study did it prospectively where they took people who were newly diagnosed and, and did questionnaires with them. Um, and there was a lot of debate, but there does seem to be perhaps an increase in irregular cycles after a diagnosis of MS. One of the disease modifying treatments, the interferons that um, some people might be on if they were first diagnosed and, and if you remain, if you, you might have been on them for quite a long time, if they were your first medication and you've remained very well, uh, they're known to cause an irregularity in your menstrual cycle, but that usually settles down within the first few months after treatment. So having a look at contraception and fertility, we don't think, and this has been quite carefully looked at, um, we don't think that MS directly affects your fertility, but women with MS have less children. Um, and then there's a lot of thinking about, well, why might that be? Uh, and a lot of those reasons are probably psychological, social, and, and perhaps even physical, rather than um, that your fertility is in any way reduced. So a lot of people have a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis in their childbearing years, and that might um, give them pause for thought. They might be starting a disease modifying treatment, which isn't really compatible with children. Women might delay a pregnancy uh, in order to ensure that the MS is completely stable. They might have a smaller family overall. And, and what I find in the discussions that I have is that women with MS probably consider the question a lot more carefully uh, than women without MS. Interestingly, there's a study done and reported quite recently that women who have previously been pregnant and have previously given birth have later onset of the clinically isolated syndrome. The clinically isolated syndrome is, is considered your first episode of MS. Now, some people never go on to develop MS, uh, but for a lot of people, it's their first episode of MS. So is there something protective about pregnancy? Um, and, and the answer is possibly, um, but we still aren't sure about that. And again, that would be kind of prior to the diagnosis. Regarding contraception, so you might want to have contraception for personal reasons, for normal reasons. You might want to have contra be on a contraceptive for reasons of treating issues with your menstrual cycle or other conditions associated with that. And some of the disease modifying treatments require you to be using a form of contraception. A um, lot of different options available, including the combined oral contraceptive pill, progesterone only, injectable implants and intrauterine devices, which are known as the LARCs, the long, um, the long acting contraceptive therapies. And really there isn't any one particular one more than the other that you should consider taking. The disease modifying treatments that most people are on don't really have any impact at all on your contraception in general. But sometimes uh, a symptomatic treatment that you might be taking for the MS can possibly have an impact on your contraception. So for example, I think modafinil, which some people might be on, also known as Provigil, uh, can sometimes reduce the effectiveness of some of the contraceptive medications. And a good person to talk to in those cases, uh, as well as your neurologist, would also be the pharmacist, who are often very aware of interactions with the different medications. So some people wonder, is it safe to use the oral contraceptive pill? And generally, the answer to that is yes. Um, 
And again, there's a lot of debate about whether or not being on the contraceptive pill is, is it protective in MS or is it a neutral effect, effect or is it a negative effect? But in one study they did about four or five years ago, they actually added a pill and they used a pill using a very high dose of estrogen and they combined it with one of the interferon treatments. And at a year they had the person, the group who were on that high dose of estrogen had less MRI activity. Now, interestingly, a group who were in a lower dose of estrogen with the interferon didn't have that benefit. Um, so it's difficult to interpret that overall, but it does suggest that perhaps higher doses of, of estrogen may have some form of beneficial effect. Um, and we've kind of mentioned that already. And really, as it's safe to use the, the oral contraceptive pill, it, is there another reason why it might be the safest form of contraception for you? And that would be people who might have a history of a clot or a family history of people who've had a clot in the lung or a clot in the leg, you might have to discuss that with your GP. If you're smoking, there's a higher risk of clotting. Uh, if, so if you're smoking over the age of 35, I think it is, it might be the best form of contraception. And again, have a chat with your GP about that. So um, there was a really nice study done in relation to pregnancy planning where um, the, the group that were doing the study went and discussed the issues that, that some people with MS had and, and where they were getting advice from, what worries they had, what they were told by clinicians, what the concerns were. Um, and some of the quotes from, from that study are here. It was published in 2013 and it describes It'd be very, I suppose, typical for what I would see in the clinic as well as some of the conversations that we would have, you know, people worried that if they stopped taking their treatment, they might have a relapse. Uh, people who have a lot of fatigue or perhaps who have some um, mobility issues might be concerned about how they might manage with a new baby. People worry about the risk of, of transmitting MS to, to the baby. Um, something that we get asked about a lot is, is can you have an epidural? And the answer is yes. Um, do you need to have a caesarean? Generally, the answer to that is no, unless there's another reason. Um, so all of these things come into play uh, when uh, people are thinking about having a baby. And um, I just thought I'd kind of bring you through what, what we're thinking about in clinic when we start having discussions. So I'll routinely ask if, um, people have any plans to have children within the next couple of years um, and I tend to ask that at every age really, every childbearing age of the patients that come in. Um, some people are probably sick of me asking the question but people's minds change from year to year and their circumstances change um, and, I, and um, what we like to do is kind of think about it a little bit further in advance uh, so that if someone does want to become pregnant they can make uh, choices based on that in relation to their treatment. If someone's changing their disease modifying treatment we'll always have a discussion about it then and uh, I suppose if someone's thinking about pregnancy within the next year or so what we're thinking about as well um, are things stable at the moment? Was the most recent scan stable? Have they had many relapses in the past or have they generally been very well before they started on their current disease modifying treatment? Were things very active or not? What medication are they on at the moment? Do we have to think about whether this medication is safe in pregnancy or not? Are they going to have to discontinue this medication? Uh, is there a chance of rebound? What medications were they on before? Um, and why did they stop them? Could we go back to one of those medications if it's a bit safer in pregnancy? And would you, nobody has to be definitive about this, but what roughly would your breastfeeding plans be postpartum if you were considering having babies? And all of these will play into the decision about what we might um, advise and what we might recommend. In general, the advice is pretty straightforward. Vitamin D and folic acid, um, you'll be having a discussion with the medical team and this was two medical teams involved and you're discussing it with us and you'll be discussing it with your obstetrician and midwife as well. Pelvic floor exercises are recommended from an early stage um, and that's because urinary problems can be quite difficult. There'll be, I suppose, two potential reasons for continence um, issues afterwards and it's good to kind of proactively work to minimize that chance. 
a lot of people with MS are more vulnerable to urinary tract infections, which isn't ideal in pregnancy. So they might need to be monitored and managed quite proactively and, and just keep a close eye out for them. Um, that you may be at a slightly higher risk of having a low mood um, after the baby is born. And I suppose advising maybe your GP about that, advising your midwife and obst obstetrician and public health nurse about that, um, because they might not be aware that you might be at a slightly increased risk of a low mood um, after the baby is born, and they'll be aware to watch out for it. Um, and advising your family and friends as well, look, look, will you keep an eye on me? Sometimes I might get a bit low. And, and I think asking for help would be very important, not to be afraid to ask for help if you need it. And if people offer the help to take it, <laughs> sometimes people can be reluctant to. I think physiotherapy could be very, very beneficial postpartum and sometimes in preparation for delivery as well, depending on your circumstances. Um, and um, Ruth Dobson, one of the neurologists in the UK, um, has spearheaded a, a really excellent paper around advice about um, management of pregnancy in people with MS um, uh, in general. And we can go into some of the specifics in a little bit more detail again. People often ask about fertility treatments and we would, we would be quite supportive of it. We, you know, we encourage people who want to go for fertility treatment to attend. However, um, there is a possibility that it could increase the risk of relapse. And usually within 90 days um, after having the, the fertility treatment, there is an increased risk of relapse there. And that'll be quite similar to what we see in the postpartum period. The, the pregnancy is overall reasonably protective, particularly the third trimester, but the first 90 days postpartum, and the risk does um, increase and the same with fertility treatment for about three months after fertility treatment particularly if it's been unsuccessful and um, there is an increased risk of relapse what i will say about that is that though the vast majority of people who have been studied uh, so far in relation to fertility treatment had discontinued disease modifying therapy um, whereas in more recent years we're probably trying to ensure that people are treated if necessary um, and partly that's because sometimes when people discontinue a medication to try to become pregnant, that they can have a very long period where they're off a disease modifying therapy. So someone might be trying for a year, 18 months and decides to go down the road of fertility treatment. So you can be getting into two to three years of treatment. And that is certainly, you know, I suppose a situation you'd want to try to avoid or discuss carefully or be monitored carefully by your neurologist if that's happening at all. And there are treatment options that can be considered, which we can talk about again. And perhaps you might be on one of those treatment options if you're going for fertility treatment, which again would minimize your risk. But like I said, we do encourage people if they wish to go for fertility treatment to absolutely go, but we might do more frequent MRI scanning to see if there's any new lesions. Um, even in the absence of a relapse, and, and we can discuss that with them if there is, and we might give the patient more frequent clinic appointments or encourage them to contact us if there's been any change. So breastfeeding is quite interesting in that there is evidence that if you exclusively breastfeed for two months postpartum, then you might reduce, you probably do reduce um, the chance of having a relapse, but it's not clear if you do mixed breastfeeding um, with formula feeding, if that effect still remains. So it's not that it's, it's not there, it's just we're not really sure if there or not. Um, and that effect is higher, I suppose, or it's more obvious if you've been, if you've had some more relapses in the past. But we do recognize that breastfeeding is very important. So we try and have discussions around this and, and plan treatment timing and um, an MRI timing postpartum to take this into account. So again, from this paper, and um, really, as I mentioned in the last few years, opinions on uh, MS treatment in pregnancy have really changed quite significantly. And now, um, a lot of people who are becoming pregnant would certainly remain on treatment up until conception uh, and quite a significant proportion would also remain on treatment for a period of time during her pregnancy. Um, and there is increasing evidence all the time in relation to that. 
Uh, we do recommend um, discontinuation of certain medications. Certain medications you certainly need to be a little bit more careful about. Um, so alamtuzumab and cladribine, for example, alamtuzumab after your treatment, you have to wait about four months um, before you'd go ahead and try to conceive. And with cladribine or mavenclad, avoid pregnancy for six months after the, the treatment course. Sorry, I'm just stuck there for a second, I'll try and move on. So another um, tricky time in a woman's life would be the menopause. And the median age of menopause is 51. And really the menopause means your last period. So it's almost a retrospective diagnosis. So um, once you've had your last period and a year has gone by, you definitely had menopause. But as I'm sure a lot of you know, for several years before that, you can be going through the perimenopause. And certainly there seems to be an association of, of progression really in MS and a lot of cognitive difficulties becoming more prominent during this period of time. Um, but it's difficult to separate out, you know, often at this point, some uh, people with MS may have had the condition for about 20, 25 years at this point, And that would be the time that you might expect to see a little bit of progression anyway. What's more certain is that it does seem to aggravate um, cognitive difficulties as I mentioned it can aggravate fatigue um, and it, it can be a period of women's life even without MS that can be very challenging and sorry, probably a period of your life that is under recognized um, and depression and anxiety can dramatically increase during this period of time again even if you don't have MS and um, so if you have a condition that I suppose increases your risk of these things uh, your experience will probably be worse. So as I mentioned, brain fog may worsen, you might be more fatigued. And because of things like the hot flushes, you might be more likely to have the pseudo relapses. Bladder symptoms can often worsen around that time and, and that's hormonally related. And you can be lucky enough to have things like insomnia, anxiety and mood difficulties. I'm sorry this isn't a bit more positive <laughs> now. You could also have uh, difficulties with sexual functioning and, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but they're very prominent around menopause for everyone um, with increased dryness, which can make sex more uncomfortable and loss of libido as well. So the management of, of menopause over the last few years, it's become something that people are, are more likely to talk about. And I think that itself is very helpful. And there are very good resources on the MS Society, MS Trust, UK website um, and the MS organizations internationally do have more specific advice uh, for people with MS but actually the information that's given to the wider community can be very helpful as well and um, there's a pod a UK podcast there postcards from midlife and they deal with all aspects of the menopause and um, there's a website my second spring and there's a clinic in Dublin I think another clinic in Cork um, which is mostly GPs run this clinic, but it's focused entirely on the menopause. I think the Dublin clinic is called the Menopause Hub. Um, because while some GPs might have some information about it, a lot of them may not specialise in particular. And I think if you did want another um, opinion from a GP who might have more specialist knowledge, it might be con worth considering uh, just going to one of these specialist services. But overall, um, the advice is the thing, things that can be quite difficult to do when you're a busy person working, perhaps the family, perhaps, um, and um, but they do help. So um, looking at sleep, trying to get into a good sleep routine, incorporating exercise in your daily life, smoking definitely aggravates the menopausal symptoms and can hasten menopause. So we would recommend stop smoking if you, st if you start and then looking for social support. Um, and I suppose, I mean, support from your family and friends if you're struggling a bit, but also seeking out maybe women around the same age as you or other people with MS around the same age as you who might be going through similar issues can be very helpful. And one study has definitely demonstrated the benefits of HRT for people with MS for their MS symptoms seem to improve quite significantly after starting HRT. So just a quick word about female sexual function in MS, and this is probably something that we don't ask about in clinic enough and, and we don't discuss enough. 
Um, and when we think about sexual functioning for both men and women in MS, we look at primary, secondary and tertiary difficulties with sexual function. So what I mean by primary difficulties with sexual function is that um, the direct effects that MS will have on your sexual function. So for men, that could be that the MS because of lesions in their spinal cord um, and in their brain, it can be more difficult for them to get an erection for women. Um, it can be increased difficulties with lubrication and that's directly because of, of the damage, a little bit of damage the MS has done. The secondary problems can be because of fatigue and if you have a profound fatigue that I'm sure some of you experience related to MS that um, you can certainly put your sex life to one side or if you have spasms or a lot of bladder or bowel dysfunction that can all make um, sex and expressing your sexuality more difficult. And my tertiary problems with sexual function is that, that maybe you lose your confidence and that holds you back um, from engaging in a more active sex life or, or perhaps you're single and you're worried about um, that your diagnosis will be difficult to discuss with a new partner and that again might hold you back a little bit. Um, so it affects up to 70% of people with MS. It can change your levels of desire, arousal, lubrication, reduce sensation, uh, and can delay or reduce your ability to orgasm. It can also make sex a little bit more uncomfortable. But there are resources out there, and again, um, I point you towards uh, the MS Trust UK website has some very good resources, including a booklet, um, sex and ms a guide for women that you can download and go through the shift ms um i suppose discussion forum really for for people with ms and um, the ms nurses and, and i find our ms nurses very helpful um in relation to this and they've often attended some training and not every ms nurse in the country will have but some of them certainly have attended some training directly in relation to, to sex and ms um, an occupational therapist can be very helpful and, and I know MS Ireland was involved in the talk that I was involved in about a year or so ago and Eva will probably be able to tell me when that was but there was an excellent um, occupational therapist who um, I think Sarah Sproul perhaps um, who did a brilliant talk about um, your sex and MS. Sometimes sex therapists and relationship counsellors can be helpful uh, and there is a sexual disability nurse in the NRH that occasionally we refer people to as well if they're struggling. So I'm just going to very quickly uh, run through a couple of questions that came through to, to Aoife beforehand. And I'm not going to go into the questions that, um, themselves, but I suppose I'm going to talk in broad terms about some of the topics that were raised. Uh, and then I think um, if you have any questions after that, um, I'm happy to go discuss them with Aoife. So uh, someone sent you a question about um, developing migraine in association with their periods. And I think this person said they were in their 40s. And that's actually extremely common. We call that catamenial migraine, migraine that predominantly occurs around the time of your menstrual cycle. And um, when I'm wearing my other hat and I'm in my... My, my migraine clinic that I sometimes do is one of the questions that I ask people who come into the clinic is do you find your headaches are much worse around the time of the period, your period and a lot of people will say yes. Now if it's only if they're predominantly really at the time of your period there's a few things you could do and one of them would be when exactly are they happening? Are they happening on the first day of your cycle? Are they happening reliably for two days prior to your cycle? And so you might need to keep a note for a couple of months to see exactly when they are. Um, and then you can look at how can you acutely treat them. So are, they, are you vomiting with them? Do you have to lie down in a dark room? Do you miss work because of them? Um, and then if they are very severe, there's a combination of medications that you can take. Um, some of them you can get over the counter and some of them you might need a prescription from your GP about them. So a lot of people who have very bad migraine have never tried a very good acute migraine medication called the triptans. Sumatriptan would be one of the more common ones. But the triptans come in all sorts of different formulations. You can um, have get injectable ones that you inject under the skin, which can get into your system very quickly. You can get some that you put in under your tongue to melt. You can get them in tablet form. You can get the ones that you have to inhale up your nose. 
again to help with absorption. And you can take that with a combination of a paracetamol, ibuprofen, and an anti-nausea tablet. And that combination of medications together will often be very helpful for migraine. If you reliably find that the migraine comes the day, say the day before the first day of your cycle, and if your cycle is kind of regular and you can track that, what we sometimes suggest that you do is take a long acting a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, such as, for example, naproxen, for a day or two beforehand, and that can prevent the migraine building up and becoming quite so severe. So that's just a couple of things. So can women with MS receive fertility treatment without relapses, and what kind of fertility treatment? So yes, you can. So as I said already, fertility treatment just does increase the chance of a relapse, but you can still, you can still have fertility treatment um, and most people who have fertility treatment don't have a relapse. So it might require some issues in relation or some discussions with your doctor about the medication that you're taking um, and do should you continue, continue your disease modifying therapy. Most kinds of fertility treatments, I mean, there doesn't seem to be one kind more than the other and IVF is slightly more associated but that's probably because you need more estrogen therapy but that'll be the commonest fertility treatment that most people would probably be going for that we would discuss with but as I've said we would encourage people if you need fertility treatment to go and um, but you just might need a little bit more careful monitoring through that. Another question about Avonex in pregnancy and whether or not you should continue taking Avonex when you become pregnant and, and up until recently it wasn't licensed for pregnancy but now you can and it's in discussion with your doctor and you can certainly take it up until conception and after that it's kind of up to you but the, the person asking this question was making a very good point that it takes a few months for Avonex to work and so they're worried that they stop it in pregnancy and start it again uh, postpartum that uh, it'll take a few months to fully take effect and won't, won't fully protect them from relapses and it's a, it's a very good point and there's no definite right or wrong answer in relation to that and probably um, it's worth another discussion with your doctor and, and a lot of the background questions I would be asking so how active is your MS to start with you know do you have quite a few lesions or do you have hardly any have you had one relapse or do you get one relapse every year um, when was the last time you had a new lesion on your scan? So how, how stable are things to start with? If things are very stable, you know, you've been doing very well, you've never had that much in the way of new lesions in your scan, you're probably safe enough to, to stay off and, and wait postpartum. And then the other thing to talk about there would be that if you're breastfeeding postpartum, you could probably breastfeed, restart Avonex around the same time, and that would give you an added degree of protection postpartum. So there was another question in relation to fertility treatment, being anti-sabri and JC virus is positive, and what about PML? So um, it's in the last couple of years, for people whose MS is a little bit more active and maybe came off treatment um, to, to try to conceive and then had a relapse, and that, you know, that we do see that. Um, and if we do see that, particularly if the relapse is, you know, a little bit more severe or if, it's a relapse that we're a bit concerned about that we absolutely certainly don't want this person to have another one. Tosabri would probably be our drug of choice because it is considered to be probably quite safe in pregnancy at the moment and, and there isn't any major concerns. Um, and some people that we put on Tosabri for pregnancy are JC virus positive. Um, and of course then there is a concern about PML, but what generally we tell people is the first two years of treatment with Tosabri the risk of PML is extremely, extremely low. So it's probably somewhere in the region of between one and 2,000 and one and 10,000. Um, on top of that, most people who receive Tysabri in pregnancy generally receive an extended interval dose. So they get the Tysabri every six or seven weeks. And a lot of people are probably in that schedule now anyway. And that further reduces the risk of PML. And we can't quantify by how much, but it certainly does further reduce the, the risk of PML. Um, usually if someone's having treatment or planning to conceive, we kind of scan beforehand and then we tee up a scan postpartum. So if you're pregnant and we know you're delivering in June, we'll schedule a scan at the beginning of July. So we can look at that again. Uh, and diagnosing 
diagnosing PML, we actually don't use uh, MRIs to diagnose it, but we use a lumbar puncture. So if someone was pregnant and we were worried that they PML, what we would be doing, what we'd be doing anyway, we'd be doing a lumbar puncture just to check. The JC virus makes absolutely no difference to pregnancy at all, which is, I think, another concern in that about half of us in the general popular population are, are wandering around with a bit of JCV in our system, uh, so it doesn't affect things at all. So a couple of other questions that came in. Uh, one was about um, someone who had a diagnosis of MS and it always had a, a bit of difficulty with their periods, quite painful and uncomfortable, but they noticed a real change in their cycle and their periods have become more um, painful after their diagnosis and they commenced treatment with Tecfidera and they were wondering, they'd been for a checkup with the gynecology and had some procedures to check if there was any other issue and there didn't seem to be. So they're wondering, was it the MS or was it the Tecfidera that could be aggravating things? And there is some evidence, as I briefly mentioned earlier on, but people do seem to, a portion of people, up to 40% of people, do seem to report an increased irregularity of their menstrual cycle after a diagnosis of MS. And we don't really know why that is. There doesn't seem to be any clear relationship with Tecfidera, but as I mentioned, interferons can cause irregularity of the menstrual cycle, but that only usually lasts for a few months. Someone else asked for supplement, about supplements for menopause. Um, and I am not really sure. I think there's variable evidence for about omega-3 may or may not be beneficial. Um, vitamin D, as we'll always kind of plan on about here, and perhaps calcium. Um, I would probably would point to, towards some of the other resources that we mentioned already. Um, but I would caution against certainly spending a lot of money on supplements um, because I know sometimes people can you know, be advised to take a lot of different things which may or may not have any evidence for. Uh, so perhaps maybe looking at some of those resources, podcasts, there's some really good books and, and uh, leaflets. Um, but apart from calcium, vitamin D and perhaps omega-3 as well, um, I'm not sure about any definite ones, but eating well, certainly seems to help i would also add to that and is hrt safe and it's as safe it seems to be as safe as it is for anyone else so if you if there's no other reason you can't take hrt and particularly if you feel like your menopause is aggravating your ms um i would encourage you to consider it you know and, and to perhaps discuss it further with your gp and that's just for Women's Day, some famous uh, women who have a diagnosis of MS, uh, Joan Didion, who actually I didn't know that she had a diagnosis of MS that she got almost 50 years ago. And she's, of course, had a very successful career as a novelist since, Selma Blair and Gina and Siegler. Um, and then some of the uh, MS researchers. And I think one of the things that will in the future drive more research into women's issues in MS is um, more female MS researchers. So we've got Sandra Vukas, who's done a lot of work in pregnancy. Jack, Jackie Palace, who's based in Oxford, and at Langer Gold, Gold in the States, has also done a lot of work. Ruth Dobson, who uh, was the lead author in those pregnancy guidelines we discussed. And uh, there is now an uh, international women in MS group that tend to meet at all the international conferences and are trying to focus further work on this. And then from our MS Society website, some of the Irish researchers who are not directly um, medically, medically based who sometimes get a little bit forgotten about when we're thinking about MS research. And then there are, of course, quite a few female neurologists. I'm sure some of you would be under their care who specialize in MS. And I think all our MS nurses in the country at the moment are women as well. And we are very fortunate to have them. So I'm just going to stop sharing at the moment and um, see if there are any questions there, Aoife, or anything you'd like to ask based on that. Yeah, super. Um, Maria, thank you so much. That was fantastic. So much information on there um, from pregnancy right through to menopause. Um, thank you for that. We do have a few questions. Some have come in sure. offline as well. Um, one here is asking, do MS relapses stop or does MS level out after menopause? Um, so, um, MS relapses, so relapsing, remitting MS, after you've had it for 
a long period of time. So that can vary between 10 and, and 15, 25 years. Generally, as time goes on, you're less likely to get relapses but you might start to pick up more symptoms related to your MS. So you mightn't get a big attack where your, you know, your vision goes or where your legs get very weak, but you might start to notice a little bit that, that maybe you can't, instead of being able to walk 10K now after 6K, you're starting to get a bit tired. Um, so I think that, I don't think it's necessarily menopause. I think it's probably, the amount of time you've had it and age that changes that pattern. Um, but there is a lot of debate about whether or not the menopause can aggravate progression a little bit. So it's difficult to say for absolutely certain. Um, and somebody um, emailed in as well to ask if it's safe to take emergency contraception on the various MS medications. Yeah, there is no, as far as I know, there is no interaction with that. Yeah, um, I've never heard any concern expressed, certainly. Um, the pharmacists are usually very good if you have any concern, but overall, they're absolutely fine. Yeah, to take emergency contraception. Just on the topic, I suppose, of sexual function, um, that's a sensitive topic to bring up with your neurologist. Do you have any tips or advice on how people can bring that up? It is very difficult to bring up and I think sometimes we avoid bringing it up as well. Um, sometimes I find when men come in, they actually say, my wife told me to bring up the fact that I'm having this problem. And I think sometimes actually as well, um, we might be more likely to bring it up with men than we are to bring it up with women. And certainly my experience has, has been that, that men are much more likely to discuss it with me. Um, which I mightn't have expected, but men are much more likely to discuss it with me th than women are. Um, and I suppose there's a few things, and, and there was some advice actually on one of the MS Trust UK websites is like, you know, maybe have it written down in your list of symptoms. You could say at the beginning, oh, there was a couple of things I wanted to check with you. One of them was, oh, I've had a bit of trouble with my hand. It's been quite numb. Oh, and just to mention as well, I'm having a little bit of a difficulty with some sexual functioning. I found that I'm very numb down there, or I found that I'm very dry and that it's quite painful. Do you have any suggestions about that? You know, so you could have your list of symptoms instead of, you know, thinking this is the only thing I need to talk about, just consider it another, another issue that you want to bring up during the consultation. Would, let's say, if somebody is experiencing a symptom like that, would that be cause for them to maybe raise it with um, their MS team as a potential relapse? So generally, it's not a potential relapse. So generally, um, the, the only time I suppose it would be associated with a relapse, you would have more symptoms. So sometimes people get um, a, a transverse myelitis or a lesion on the spinal cord, which can cause numbness around the waist uh, and around that whole area um, and generally in the context of that it's that's not the only symptom that you're having but you might say i've noticed when i'm wiping myself going to the toilet that i'm very numb down there and i've noticed that when i have started having sex i can't feel anything down there but usually you'll have more symptoms than just that sexual function but i would bring it up because people bring up spasms for example to us all the time in clinic you know so it's a similar problem to that you know that if and, it, and I think sexual function is such a big impact on your quality of life another resource I think to use would be the MS nurses they deal with these questions all the time and they'll have more time so it's not going to be a rushed add-on to a clinic appointment that you're having every six months or every year where you're also talking about your disease modifying treatment and you're talking about your MRI scan results um, and you're talking about your blood tests and you're talking about a lot of other different things. If you are able to email your MS nurse or ask for a call back, you'll have a dedicated period of time. And I know in some of the hospitals, the MS nurses do clinics themselves where they could bring you in and just go through that one topic in a little bit more detail and with a little bit more time to kind of go through the different options. And that can be just increasing lubrication, for example, um, if some people have uh, physical difficulties that are having an impact on intercourse, can be even advice about physicians can be very helpful or pointing, pointing you towards resources where you can look into that yourself. Thank you. 
Um, and we had an email in from somebody who was diagnosed with MS after um, their first child was born. And they're wondering, is there, to just in order to stabilize their MS between pregnancies, is there an optimal amount of time, let's say, to be on a medication to stabilize things before they would consider a second pregnancy? Uh, it's a very good question. I don't, I don't think there's necessarily, and well, I suppose the reason there isn't an optimal time, and it partly depends on what disease modifying treatment that you're on. Um, so um, I'd probably give it about a year to 18 months to see if things were stable, and then I'd take things from there. But for example, if you were being treated with um, cladribine or alantuzumab, there would be a minimum time there really of 18 months to, to go through your two cycles of treatment. Then after that 18 months, you can kind of crack on and you don't have to worry because they are um, long acting medications, you know? Uh, so it, it very much would depend on the treatment that you're on, but I would probably say give it a year. I'd probably say give it a year. And, and do that, you know, try and have a scan booked shortly before if you're discontinuing the treatment depending on, on what the treatment is. Thank you and for people let's say um, somebody were to um, unexpectedly become pregnant while on treatment what advice do you have for somebody in that situation who might not know actually what they should do um, if that happens? Try not to panic would be my first piece of advice because I think that's sometimes what people do and, uh, and I think being on a disease modifying treatment people do tend to panic and I would definitely contact your neurologist your MS nurse specialist often even the quickest person to be able to contact so I'd contact them as soon as possible some medications you'll need to discontinue pretty quickly um, and I would look at Obagio in particular about that uh, and then but a lot of the medications there isn't a huge concern about increased risk with them and a lot of the studies that have been done so for example Bengalamud or Jelenia, we would generally, we would always say come off it before pregnancy. Um, and there is some evidence that perhaps it slightly increases the risk of malformation, but those studies are small. For example, one of those studies was based on two people out of 44 had, uh, who had been recently treated with Jelenia um, had a baby with a malformation versus one person out of 45 who weren't on it. So the numbers are tiny and it's, so what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is there's no need to absolutely panic and um, contact your team as soon as possible uh, and take things from there. Thank you. And I can see here in the Q&A, somebody has asked what the risk for children is developing MS if a parent has it. So it's probably a, less than about one in 60. So in and around that. So the, the, in Ireland and the general population, it's about probably one in 350 to 400. Um, so if you have a parent with MS, the risk is definitely higher, but you're still much, 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 much more likely not, <laughs> your child is much more likely not to have, get MS than they are to get MS. So it's, it's about one in 60, which is low, you know, and bearing in mind how much things are improving all the time, uh, with the diagnosis and management of MS, I would certainly um, not let that concern guide your decisions too strongly. Um, there is a question here in the chat as well from somebody who has had MS but been stable for 10 years. Um, before that, it was very active. They're now on Jelenia and worried to come off it. Um, for the washout period and risk relapsing before becoming pregnant. They were on Tysabri for many years before and came off two years ago um, due to a positive PML test. Um, perhaps this may not be an option to go back on this treatment. I think that's one to have a discussion with your neurologist. And, and the reason I'm saying that is uh, I'm not sure if what, what your positive JCV test is. So if you're, if you're positive, so first of all, were you negative for a long time, got a positive JCV test? and then came off or was it always positive and was getting higher was it a very low so we look at um whether you're low positive kind of medium positive or high positive and low positive your risk is very low of pml and generally if we'd be looking at kind of going back on it could be a time limited thing i suppose so and um, by that i mean you might say okay you'll go back on for pregnancy but postpartum you know we'll put you back on to something else will have a different treatment in mind for example one that would come to mind would be ocrelizumab i think it would depend on how soon you were planning to conceive 
So I think that'd be something to, to discuss as well. So for example, ocrelizumab might be a treatment option if you weren't thinking about getting pregnant for six or 12 months. Um, the license is 12 months. In Europe, that's accepted as the license, but it is quite long um, before you try and conceive. But if you did a couple of years of ocrelizumab under your belt, then you'd probably be quite safe giving yourself the time uh, to try and conceive and not be too worried about a relapse. Jelani is a bit of a tricky one. Um, because there is that risk of, of the washout period. But Tysabri may be an option to go back on again. It's just you need to look at your individual circumstances. Um, or depending on how things were, you could go back on uh, Capaxone or Avonex and one of those other treatments. Even if they're less effective, they do have a benefit. Um, and there's a message just in from somebody who has relapsing remitting MS. They have had two pregnancies and felt amazing during both of them. Um, I was on no medication and I'm not. Is there a supplement or hormone I can take to give the effect I'm, preg or I'm getting while pregnant? I'm currently still on no medication three years post-pregnancy. There's been no progress for them so far. So I'm delighted to feel they, that they felt so well and that would certainly be some people's experience that they do feel very well, but I don't think there is any uh, medication that can mimic that. I mean, the oral contraceptive pill and is to a certain extent does provide you with some of the hormones that you have when you're pregnant um, but not nearly to the same level and, and um, I wouldn't be too sure about that but I think if you're feeling very well and your scans are absolutely stable and there's been no change um, then that's absolutely fine but I just don't think there's necessarily any um, supplement that can mimic that effect particularly. Um, and somebody has asked, how often MRIs are recommended with secondary progressive MS or is it indicated? It absolutely depends. So, um, and it's one of the tricky things with progressive MS. So we'd be looking at a few different things. One is, is, is are things progressing rapidly or are they progressing very slowly? How long have you been in the progressive phase of the condition? Have you had a scan at all while you've been in the progressive phase of the condition? Is it possible that you might be eligible for a treatment? So I would certainly, if you haven't had one for a few years, I might look at discussing with your neurologist certainly about having um, a scan to see if there's been any new activity because if there is any new activity in that scan then you might well be eligible for uh, one of the disease modifying treatments that are currently available or becoming available in the next little while there might be a treatment option for you but, but if you've had a scan recently that hasn't shown any new activity and you've been in the progressive phase for a while then there isn't necessarily in, any indication for annual MRIs or anything like that so it's it's a difficult to be definitive about it. Just in relation again to pregnancy, and you said earlier that in um, kind of 90 days postpartum, there is that kind of increased risk of relapse during that time. But I suppose that time for people kind of post-pregnancy as well, or, or just after birth, there is that baby brain and, you know, there's lack of sleep and all those things. So in terms of, I suppose, deep, like untangling um, symptoms that you may be having for a, is that like a normal you know symptom for um, somebody who's just given birth versus this is potentially an MS relapse do you have any kind of guidance for people in relation to that? So a couple of things so just just contact us and have a chat to us about it so um, generally in all our patients who become pregnant we're, we're planning their scans from the time that we know they've conceived pretty much you know exactly <laughs> conceived, but from quite early on in the pregnancy, we're planning when we're having a scan. So um, with your team, you should have a scan scheduled within the first couple of months postpartum, because even if you don't have a relapse, there might be a couple of new little lesions there, which would mean we'd act a little bit more quickly and try and get you established on medication a little bit more quickly. Then you've got to think about, just as you said, all the other things that goes on postpartum. So maybe if it is a cesarean infection and maybe if it's slow wound healing, there might be a wound infection that's bringing out some symptoms that look like an MS relapse. But I think just talk to us, talk about the symptoms that you're having. And we can see if, if you're worried that it's a relapse, just talk to us, you know, because there is an increased risk there. Now, again, what I would say is that there is an increased risk 
but most people don't have a relapse postpartum. You know, we would be much more likely to see maybe one or two new dots in the scan than we would be to see somebody coming in with a bad relapse. You know, that's it's not our expectation, you know. Um, but just chat to us and, and we can take you through all the different points. But I would agree, a lot of those things can certainly make you feel pretty terrible <laughs> when you've got a newborn in the house, you know. Um, and somebody else is asking if there is any link between MS and endometriosis. So I don't think there definitively is. Um, I suppose MS is very common, as we've kind of discussed in women, and endometriosis is probably more common than is recognised. And because endometriosis is associated with a lot of menstrual cycle pain and irregularity, that that will definitely aggravate your MS symptoms. Um, if, you ha if you have bad endometriosis, you probably feel worse in general overall. Your pain will be probably heightened, your fatigue will probably be heightened. Um, I don't think there's any kind of similar cause, but certainly I think if you have endometriosis and MS, you probably will feel particularly bad at certain times of the month. And it might be something that might need to be treated a bit more actively, although I know that endometriosis can be very difficult to manage. Thank you. In relation to um, fertility treatment, um, Maria, is there any concerns for people or anything that they should kind of factor in if they are going for fertility treatment like IVF or IUI? Is there anything that they need to kind of consider or is it a discussion that they maybe need to have with the neurologist before they link in with anybody on this or at what point should they link in with the neurologist? I think if you're planning and going for IVF or fertility treatment, you should talk to us first, you know, just to have a look at the disease modifying treatment regime that you're on. Are you going to discontinue that? Does this need to be changed? Um, you know, so things like that um, would be a good idea to go through with your neurologist in advance of having treatment. Um, but and what I find sometimes is if you've had that discussion with your neurologist that you know what the plan is, let's say, for example, I might meet with somebody and, okay, you're having your IVF treatment. Okay, that's great. We'll book a scan in about three or four months time. And if you're pregnant, we'll cancel it. So that's what I might say to somebody so that we can get an idea that there is a plan in place. We're going to be keeping an eye on them. We're going to see if there's any new activity in the scan. Um, but if they're pregnant, we're going to cancel the scan and continue with pregnancy and do everything you know, that we need to do to support that. Um, and sometimes I think having that conversation can ease people's minds a little bit and make them a little bit relaxed when they're going into the IVF. Because I think I do, what I do see is, is going through the two things can cause a lot of extra anxiety and worry people are thinking oh no i'm going for fertility treatment i'm off my medication what am i going to do if this doesn't work you know and, and so to have a plan in place with your ms team about the fertility treatment process that you're going through and to link in as carefully as as possible that would be really all it's all i'd suggest you know and just talk to us and we can take your wishes into account in relation to treatment in relation to what you'd like to do brilliant well we're just about time now. So Dr. Gohan, thank you so much for joining us this evening on International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to you and to everybody who has joined us for this this evening. I want to also say a huge thank you to my colleagues in the Northwest region who um, for their work on this webinar. And that's it from us this evening. And um, thank you so much again, Dr. Gohan, for your time. We really appreciate it. And we are looking forward to our next session with you. Take care now. Bye-bye.